12. The Night Beat starts right now. Clouded by confusion, a plan to reopen left flea markets looking for answers. While malls were allowed to reopen, the city of San Antonio told Traders Village to keep their doors closed. But was it a mistake? What we're now learning from a state agency and how the city's responding coming up. And we want to take you to some late breaking news tonight, not far from the KSAT studios here just north of downtown. This is happening on the 1400 block of North Main by San Antonio Colleges, where we are getting word of a shooting at this hour. Yeah, you can see there are a number of uh, bars that obviously are not open at this point, and you can actually see it may be right next to Crockett Park. I believe that's the park that's right there uh, near some of the housing for San Antonio College students. You can actually see some officers in the street with a flashlight trying to check out and perhaps get evidence. Again, this is the 1400 block of North Main. We'll continue to monitor the situation, have any updates throughout the next hour. Also new on the night beat, a San Antonio family claiming a local funeral home lost their grandmother's body. When the family went to rosary services last Friday at Castillo Mission Funeral Home, they say they found another woman lying in their grandmother's casket. The night team's Tim Gerber has the exclusive interview with the grieving family. Um, when we finally got in there, we as soon as we approached the casket and we viewed her right away, we all knew it was not her. Irene Blanco and her family made a shocking discovery last Friday when they arrived at Castillo Mission Funeral Home to hold services for their grandmother, Dolores Gutierrez de Leon. Someone else was in her casket. Her face, everything was just completely different. There was no way. Blanco says when they approached the funeral director, they offered to look for identifying marks on the body to confirm it was de Leon. But when they looked for a scar from a hip replacement, it wasn't there. Um, so it is 100% guaranteed that that is not our grandmother. The family demanded to know where De Leon's body was, but the funeral home had no answers. They're basically just trying to locate her. They, as of right now, the woman that is in that casket, they do not know who it is. Blanco says De Leon was in hospice care at a relative's home and passed away on April 23rd. The funeral home sent two people to pick up the body. According to the family and online obituaries posted on the funeral home's website, another woman by the name of Dolores Gutierrez died on April 21st, and her funeral was held on April 30th, the day before De Leon services. I want to find my grandmother. I don't know, because with that woman, they buried her. So I don't know if she was buried with the wrong family or she's somewhere else. I went to the funeral home this afternoon to get their side of the story but they weren't talking. I, unfortunately, at this time, we can't comment on anything. Today, De Leon's family filed a lawsuit against the funeral home seeking a jury trial and damages in excess of a million dollars. This should not happen, not to any family, not to us, not to anybody. We trust them with our grandmother, with our loved one, with the day that she passed, and they should be able to tell us where she is. Tim Gerber, KSAT 12 News. Now, the family has hired Mark Greenwald to represent them. He's the same attorney who handled the case of Julie Mott. Her body was stolen from a different local funeral home in 2015 and has never been found. Let's take a look at the latest numbers tonight when it comes to COVID-19 in Bear County. Out of more than 28,000 tests, more than 1,600 people have come back with positive results. More than 800 have recovered so far. The amount of deaths have increased by four tonight for a total of 52. Three of those deaths were told to actually happened last month, but the city was just notified. We now know the fourth death was Clifford Childs, an inmate who apparently contracted the disease at the Bear County Jail. Now, when it comes to cases in and out of the Bear County Jail, more than 1300 cases are in the community. 49 of those cases are among jail staff. More than 200 cases are among jail inmates. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf saying many of the cases are asymptomatic. Dr. Ruth Bergeron with UT Health San Antonio reminding us why it is important to care about the number of cases both in our community and in the Bear County Jail. We have people who continue to be brought into the jail as potential inmates, a lot of them. Uh, in a city this size, we have you know, 50 to 70 or 80 people who may come in, be brought in to be detained, and then we have close to that many that are going out every day because they get they serve their time or they get uh, reevaluated and then they get uh, bailed out. 
Okay, so you have this constant coming in and going out of inmate, the inmate population as well as the worker population. And that means every time somebody goes out of the jail, they could be bringing the virus to others in the community. Coming up, what you should know about asymptomatic cases. We take your questions to Dr. Berger and as part of our coronavirus Q&A. Well, as Texas moves to reopen, there's been some confusion between what can and cannot reopen. Flea markets found themselves in the middle of it all. City leaders said Traders Village, San Antonio, would not be able to reopen. And just yesterday, the mayor directed businesses to the Texas Division of Emergency Management website when considering a business as essential. Tonight, our Tiffany Huertas checked in with the department and learned a change may be in the works. This past week, we thought we were going to open, and uh, a lot of the vendors were excited because they had been closed for a while. Javier Galvan is one of the vendors at Traders Village San Antonio. While some businesses reopened, the flea market did not. About three o'clock Friday evening, before we were, you know, we already announced all week that we were going to be open, uh, we had to, uh, we got word that we cannot open. We have about 100 or something permits. Uh, that state that we are a retail facility and they're deeming us that we're not, I, I don't understand. Other flea markets opened this weekend, including Traders Village Grand Prairie and Traders Village Houston. Ken Hins, the general manager of Traders Village Houston, says they are located outside the Houston city limits in the unincorporated area of Harris County. He says Harris County sent out two officers to inspect them and they were approved to open. The mayor of San Antonio addressed why the flea market could not open here. Unless the business is expressly listed as a reopened business or an essential business within the governor's order, the governor retains the right to open or close that business. The best guidance for a business who believes that that interpretation is, is not correct would be through the Texas Department of Emergency Management where there's a portal that allows for a business that's not listed in the governor's order to get a determination. On the Texas Division of Emergency Management's website, it explains essential services and reopened services. On this page, businesses can fill out their information and request that their business be designated essential. A spokesperson for the Texas Division of Emergency Management sent us a statement regarding flea markets in part, quote, flea markets are a type of shopping mall. Shopping malls are currently able to operate as a reopened service, end quote. Some of these vendors depend on this business to put food on their table, to pay their bills and things like that. And uh, it, it was devastating for them to, to be told at the last minute that we couldn't open. After learning about the information the state sent us, the president of Traders Village, Tim Anderson, said they are excited to learn about this news. They said they will work to confirm information and details so that Traders Village can reopen this weekend. This evening, a spokesman for the mayor's office sent us a statement saying, quote, if we get direction from the Texas Division of Emergency Management, we will follow it, end quote. They also said they open, they will have to follow social distancing and capacity requirements outlined in the governor's order. Steve Isis. It certainly seems like they should be able to reopen. Thank you, Tiffany. All right, less than a week since Texas started to reopen. Governor Greg Abbott now announcing more reopenings set to happen in just a few days. Starting this Friday, cosmetology businesses will be allowed to operate as long as they keep workstations six feet apart. Governor Abbott also recommends salons use an appointment only system and limit stylists to one customer at a time. Tanning salons and swimming pools also will be allowed to reopen Friday with restrictions. Then 10 days later, on Monday, May 18th, gyms will be allowed to reopen at up to 25% of their total occupancy. Locker rooms and shower facilities must remain closed. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg expressed some concern about how soon this next phase of reopenings is coming. And I think one of the challenges is we don't know the impacts of choices we make in terms of opening activities and loosening social distancing for two or three weeks after we make them. So steps taken in succession without the benefit of data to reinforce the decision is really a, a, a risk that we're taking without a whole lot of um, awareness. And while they don't have the power to control when businesses will reopen, the county city economic transition team says they do have recommendations for safely reopening businesses in our area. One of them being a campaign where business owners sign a pledge promising to follow safety guidelines such as requiring face coverings be worn. You can read their full report right now on our website, ksat.com.
Well, let's take a look at the cases of COVID-19 in our surrounding counties. Hayes County is jumping up to 183 cases. Guadalupe County reporting 87. Comal County has 59. Wilson County at 34. Atascosa County is at 19, while Medina County increased to 20 cases. We're also tracking these numbers on our website, ksat.com. And whether it's loss of work, working from home, or being affected by illness, work-related stress is at unprecedented levels. That's why the Chamber of Commerce is stepping in with a free webinar rounding up mental health experts to talk about coping mechanisms for both employers and employees. The Chamber President tells the Night Team's Courtney Friedman a big part of the conversation will be about domestic violence and how co-workers and managers can look out for each other. It's part of Courtney's series, Confronting Domestic Violence, Loving in Fear. The COVID-19 pandemic hard on the wallet and hard on the mind. Even the San Antonio Chamber of Commerce is acknowledging the importance of mental health care. I have experienced it in my own family, the need for uh, finding services. You know, where do you call? And so it, it, people are um, in a frenzy and we're really trying to give them opportunities to take a breath and let them know that there are resources available that they can use for themselves or their families. Chamber President Richard Bettez highlights one type of stress in particular that many in the workplace don't typically consider, abuse at home. Experts say when families are stressed and stuck at home together, domestic violence numbers mm -hmm. spike. Bettez says he's been working on outreach for months. In the city, um, you know, they came out with that report about the incidence of domestic violence. That kind of was the red flag that said, we have a big problem and it belongs to all of us to try to figure it out. That dialogue about to take place this Thursday in the form of a free public webinar. It's hosted by the Chamber of Commerce and there are going to be experts from UT Health San Antonio and the city of San Antonio. You just go to this website and click register. Experts know work is one of the main places victims can go to get away from their abuser. So coworkers and managers have a responsibility to pay attention. And the challenge is how do you talk about it and the workplace, right? I mean, we want to equip people with tools so that when they see um, signs, they can feel confident to be able to go and talk to an employee about, is this happening? And, and not to get too personal, but by the way, there's some resources that you can use. Conversations that may seem uncomfortable, but can be life-saving. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. The free webinar is open to the public. It is this Thursday, May 7th at 10 a.m. We have the link for registration on ksat.com. There we also have a link for those who want to join the Chamber of Commerce. It's not your normal police chase. Still ahead on the night beat, a chase that started in Seguin ended here in San Antonio. The arrest made after a stolen food truck was found. Coming up. And is there a situation where an antibody test would be recommended. The answer to your questions coming up in our coronavirus Q&A. Plus, a local school district not alone. They are all facing challenges when it comes to preparing for the next semester. What superintendents are telling KSAT next on the Night Beat. If school will not look or feel the same when kids return to the classroom, local school districts are trying to make plans for summer and fall semesters but it's proving to be a difficult task. Two local superintendents tell the night team's Patty Santos they're facing social distancing rules and budget constraints. What I would tell the community is, you know, really let's go semester by semester. Local school districts are learning how to be flexible and are ready to pivot based on what the guidelines may be come August. SAISD Superintendent Pedro Martinez and NISD Superintendent Brian Woods are trying to figure out what model will work for their districts. We know that we've got to make a plan to continue at least for some of our students in distance learning. Both say online learning has worked well for some families, but not all. On the flip side of that is we've also learned that there are groups of students for whom this is clearly not the best option. And so as soon as we can get them back into buildings, they will be better served. Anticipate lunch in classrooms, fewer students on the bus, and likely the absence of contact sports, among other changes. Both superintendents say parents should expect to see some sort of blended model, possibly including some at-home learning with classroom time, but they say the model could vary from school to school. It could be that 
We stage uh, kids, um, you know, with different schedules. Some of my buildings right now uh, have enough space that we can bring in children and space them out throughout the building. I have other schools where that's just not the case. Martinez wants to hear from parents. My concern is, you know, how do I uh, help families that, you know, where the parents are working and they don't have child care. But all the extra flexibility, added resources and technology will take a toll on their budgets. Certainly any of these options are more expensive than what we would traditionally do. Schools are designed for efficiency. Uh, they're really not designed uh, for social distancing. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. It is interesting just thinking yeah. forward, you know, what oh, the fall could be like. Yeah, after even the summer, I know a lot of summer school programs are up in the air, so yeah, time will I, tell for I was, sure. I was glad weather-wise we got a little yeah. respite from summer today. Yeah, we did. Yesterday we were well into the 90s at 97, and today we briefly hit 91, but most of our day was spent in the 80s. And we actually have a cold front that's still moving through South Texas. It's going to have an impact on our weather for the next few days, and then another cold front to talk about that hits us on Friday. So a lot to cover here. Let's get right to it. Look across the state throughout the day today. We were in the 70s in North Texas. Dallas topped out at 79. Look at Lubbock at 77. Meanwhile, Laredo 99, Brownsville 94, and even Del Rio topped out at 92 degrees today. So we had some heat, especially in far south Texas, but the hill country only in the 70s. I mean, Kerrville was 79 today. Meanwhile, 99 in Laredo. So big temperature difference out there earlier, and that's because of this cold front that has slowly been pushing southward. Behind it, we have some 60s already in the hill country, 68 Rock Springs and Fredericksburg as well. We're 76 here in San Antonio, but still hanging on to a few 80s farther south of town. So overall, a little closer to average the next couple of days in terms of high temperatures. We're looking at mid 80s Wednesday and Thursday. Friday, a cold front hits. Look what that does to Saturday. Temperatures really fall off into the mid 70s for afternoon highs on Saturday. So that next cold front that hits us early Friday, it's going to let its let its presence known around South Texas here. The wind has shifted. That's one thing we've noticed with this cold front that northerly breeze and that's that drier breeze. So dew points have really fallen and dropped off quite a bit and our dew points now are about 10 to 20 degrees lower than this time yesterday. So you may have noticed that lack of humidity out there this evening, opposed to even just earlier today in the morning. And overall, if you don't like the humidity and the mugginess in the air, the next five to seven days are gonna be favorable for you. We'll briefly see a little uptick in the mugginess late Thursday and early Friday. But otherwise, you look at those dew point numbers and they're going to be down by and large uh, for a good portion of this forecast period here. All right, let's talk about rain. The cold front kick started a few showers and storms right along the coastal plain there, east and southeast of San Antonio this afternoon and into the early evening hours. That activity has mostly fizzled out, but we may see more development later on tonight, and that could even be around San Antonio. So we'll have a little impulse of energy that could kickstart a few showers. And I like this future cast indicating yeah, a few hit or miss splash and dash showers, maybe an isolated thunderstorm through the night tonight and sunrise tomorrow. Notice even 6 a.m. could have a few little light showers here and there. I'd say about 30% coverage, maybe 40% if we're lucky across South Texas. And then once we get to the midday hours, the sun starts to come out and those rain chances really fall off. So we'll give it a 30 to 40% chance for the nighttime hours through about 9 a.m. and then just becoming partly cloudy. 85, not too humid tomorrow. 60s in the morning, 80s in the afternoon. Very similar story on Thursday, partly cloudy. Near 60 to start the day, 86 then by the afternoon. Friday is that day where that next cold front hits. So with it, a slight chance of rain. I wish we had better rain chances, but right now it's looking like 20%. A gusty north wind lower 80s and then boom Saturday morning. We're waking up to lower 50s only in the 70s in the afternoon. Very similar as we get into Sunday Mother's Day and uh, low humidity as well. So this weekend is shaping up to be a fantastic one. Perfect. Thank you so much, Adam. All right. I knew this guy had Texas roots. I didn't know he also has a Texas residence. Yes, he does. And how the COVID-19 pandemic actually played a role in making a decision because he says he had a total of six offers to play quarterback. We're talking about Andy Dalton, the new backup quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys and Caden Stearns answering the call for help in San Antonio coming up. Pro 
football coverage. Powered by Davis Law Firm. For the first time since he signed his one-year contract with the Dallas Cowboys on Monday, Andy Dalton is talking. The former Bengals quarterback who was cut to make room for the national champion, the Heisman Trophy winner Joe Burrow to take his place, will make a base salary of $3 million, could make up to $7 million with incentives. In an interview on an ESPN podcast, Dalton, who is now 32 years old, was asked why he chose Dallas after the former TCU quarterback revealed he had five other offers to play quarterback. Dalton says playing for new head coach Mike McCarthy was a factor in his decision to back up Dak Prescott at quarterback. You know, I wanted to join a high-class organization, a team that's ready to win and um, and be with, with, with Mike McCarthy, who's uh, this, this, his history with quarterbacks. You know, I think it gives me a chance to come to a, a new place, a chance to learn, to help Dak out, Dak out any way I can, and um, you know, and then just to be an asset for this team. Obviously, I, I bring a lot of experience and, and can bring a lot to the table. So uh, I'm here to help this team win and uh, help in any way I can. After being cut after nine seasons in Cincinnati, Dalton, who was drafted by the Bengals out of TCU in 2011, admitted the COVID-19 pandemic played a role in his return to Texas, where he still owns a home. That was definitely part of it. Obviously, that wasn't the only de- deciding factor. Um, but for us to stay stay close to home, like you said, we already have a house here, and uh, you know, not have to move, not have to figure out the whole logistics of of that transition, uh, especially during a time like this where there's a lot of unknown of what's going to happen and when uh, you know when things are going to start up and all that kind of stuff. So it's uh, you know it's all factored into. Um, in, in, into my decision. Now, there are those who believe the Cowboys signed Dalton just to put pressure on Dak Prescott, who so far has not signed a long-term deal with Dallas. Cowboys claim that's not true. They just want a quality backup quarterback after what happened against the Eagles in Philadelphia last December, where Prescott struggled with an injured shoulder and a loss that effectively ended the Cowboys' season. The New York Giants have claimed former Cowboys backup quarterback Cooper Rush off waivers after he was cut by the Cowboys on Monday following the signing of Andy Dalton. The move reunites Rush with former Cowboys coach Jason Garrett, who's now the offensive coordinator for the Giants after his contract was not renewed at the end of the 2019 season. Rush now joins starter Daniel Jones, veterans Alex Tanney and Colt McCoy with undrafted rookie Case Cookus in the Giants quarterback's room. McCoy, the former Texas Longhorns quarterback, signed this offseason as a free agent for $2.25 million with only $500,000 guaranteed. A Rush, according to ESPN, signed for $2.1 million in a one-year deal. The NFL is set to release its 2020 NFL schedule this Thursday night at 7 p.m. that due to the coronavirus is not set in stone at this point. And one of the factors in kicking off this season is getting enough time for players to get in shape. That was one of the major concerns expressed today by Texas defensive star J.J. Watt in an interview with Sports Illustrated. The three-time defensive player of the year is concerned with players' health and safety in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic that has forced players to work out at home with team facilities and gyms closed. Watt is concerned the risk of injury will increase if players are not allowed a significant amount of time to get in shape before the regular season kicks off after organized team activities have been reduced to virtual instruction by strength and conditioning coaches. It was also the first time to hear from the Texans team leader since Bill O'Brien decided to trade their top wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins to the Arizona Cardinals. Wadu teamed up with Hop for seven seasons, admitted today it was always tough to lose a guy like that no matter what the situation is, calling DeAndre the best hands in the game. When pressed by SI for an answer on O'Brien's decision to trade DeAndre, Watt's response was it's above my pay grade. The Texas Longhorns and former Steel star Caden Stern speaks out this offseason next. Former Steel star Caden Stearns has been very visible during the COVID-19 pandemic, helping to raise money for the San Antonio Food Bank while participating in the birthday parade for Judson Rocket and cancer patient Bryce Wisdom. Caden has teamed with five other local athletes, including former Longhorn and Steel star Malcolm Brown, who now plays for the Rams, with a goal to raise $50,000 for the San Antonio Food Bank. In a Zoom interview today, Stearns, who plays now currently to the Texas Longhorns, tells us it was Bryce's brothers Rashad, who plays for UTSA, that reached out to him for help. Rashad, he sent me uh, on t- something on Twitter and it's about the, the San Antonio Food Bank being backed up like miles or like a mile or something where people were actually, they were struggling to feed people. My mom, the next day, sent me something about it. And so it was like a sign that I think this is what um, we need to do. So um, all the guys have been very helpful. 
Now Stern says he is treating as if the 2020 season will kick off on time with the proper safety precautions to guard against the spread of the coronavirus. And when it does, he knows he will have to be one of the defensive leaders for the Longhorns as a junior looking to bounce back from their 8-5 and five finish last year that led to wholesale coaching changes, including new defensive coordinator Chris Ash. So it's great to see these guys teaming up and helping do something and give back to their community. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Greg. Well, we want to get back to that breaking news that we brought you at the top of this newscast. Police telling us a man was shot in the chest near Main and Laurel Street. Yeah, it's near Crockett Park and the Tobin Lofts, not far from San Antonio College. Officers say the man managed to make it back to an apartment at the Tobin Lofts, told his roommates he was shot near the park. That man is now heading to the hospital in serious condition. Still ahead, a food truck taken from its owner. The 30-minute chase that ended in arrests coming up. And our coronavirus Q&A is next. President Donald Trump traveling out of Washington, D.C. for the first time in nearly two months, visiting a Honeywell factory in Phoenix, Arizona, that's now making N95 masks. As ABC's Romina Puga reports, the nation continues to debate when and how to open up again safely. The coronavirus death toll now over 70,000. At least 38 states easing restrictions, while the number of cases is on the rise in at least 19 of them. Will some people be affected? Yes. Will some people be affected badly? Yes. But we have to get our country open, and we have to get it open soon. ABC's David Muir is speaking to President Trump on Tuesday, who was touring a Honeywell factory in Phoenix that's now making N95 masks. House, David asked the president what is, to expect when doors reopen. Time, we're going to practice social distancing. We're going to be washing hands. We're going to be doing a lot of the things things that we've learned to do over the last period of time and we have to get our country back. The president saying the decision to initially close the country was the biggest decision yeah, he's ever had to country. make. Said, what are you talking about close the country because nobody's ever heard of such a thing. When asked about the two new analysis that are cautioning premature openings, one from Johns Hopkins that warned the daily death rate could double by June, the other from the University of Washington estimating that the number of deaths could increase to nearly 135,000 by August 4th. The president all, had this to say. These models have been so wrong from day one. And more news confirming that the White House Coronavirus Task Force, that group of experts that Americans have all become so familiar with, will be winding down in the coming weeks as the administration looks to a new phase of the pandemic. But we're now looking at a little bit of a different form, and that form is safety and opening, and we'll, uh, we'll have a different group probably set up for that. The president also said he thinks we have a real shot at something substantial in terms of getting a vaccine by the end of the year. This says the new task force will focus on vaccines, testing, therapeutics, and reopening the economy. In Los Angeles, Romina Puga, ABC News. Every weekday, we're continuing our effort to fight fear with facts as the coronavirus pandemic continues to impact communities across the globe. Infectious disease expert Dr. Ruth Bergeron from the Long School at UT Health San Antonio is back with us this week to help us get answers to your coronavirus questions. Dr. Bergeron, thank you for joining us as you do on every Tuesday. I appreciate it. Today, Governor Abbott announced plans to reopen hair salons, nail salons, swimming pools, gyms, exercise facilities. Are we ready for all that? So, um, Steve, I want to remind everybody that the way we assess um, how risky a particular enterprise or business is has to do with um, the contact intensity, meaning how close are you to other people and for what duration? Are you real close and for a long time or not so much? The second parameter is how many people are you exposed to in a particular environment? Is it um, many or few? And then the third thing is how modifiable is this environment? Can you fix it by spacing uh, spacing it out between barber chairs, for instance. So by those parameters, Steve, if you compare uh, salons to restaurants, they both come out to be about medium risk. And that's kind of interesting. You have more people that you might get exposed to in a restaurant than a salon, but you have uh, less intensity there. And so uh, at the end of the day, restaurants and salons are not especially different by the criteria that we apply from an infectious disease standpoint. Now, all that is 
to say, you still have to uh, pay attention to the physical distancing guidelines and modify the environment where possible. Don't let 50 people into your barber shop, right? Um, space the chairs out so there's six feet in between people. Have folks wear a mask. Do your surface cleansing. Make sure that high touch surface areas are getting cleansed regularly. And if those things can be done, whether it's a barber shop or a gym, um, then that modified risk is probably in the medium range, which is similar to restaurants. I hope that makes some sense. It does, it, but from, from your from your medical experience and your, your medical opinion, it, would you prefer we waited a few more weeks? I would, because I'm gonna take us back to those progress indicators that we talked about last week um, when our health transition team put out our report. And remember that we wanted to see a 14-day decline in new cases. We wanted to see a healthy, unstressed healthcare system. Arguably, we may have both of those. It depends on how you want to count new cases, okay? Um, but the other two parameters, do we have a contact tracing team ready to go? Nope. We need 175 contact tracers ready to go. Um, and do we have enough tests? Can we test 30,000 people a week in San Antonio? No, we cannot. We can test about 1,600. Now, a week from now could be a very different story. I know that we're going to have increased capacity at University Hospital. But, Steve, we've got 3,000 people in the jail, and it's taking us weeks to test that population. So we're very far away from being able to test 3,000 people in our community. Therefore, we never really have met the step, the phase two progress indicators. So I worry about all of these places opening up by those measures. In what situation, this is a, a, a big controversy now because there are a lot of people offering antibody tests. In what situation should I get an antibody test? Are there any situations where it would be counterproductive? Yeah, so great question and timely question and everybody's buzzing about antibodies because there's tons of tests from a bunch of different companies. And please know that in several weeks and several months, my answer will change because we're going to have more information. But today, from where we stand here in San Antonio, um, it is very likely that a positive test does is no better than a coin toss in telling you whether you have a true positive or whether you have a false positive. And the reason that could be bad is that if it changes your behavior, so you now think, hey, I'm invincible, I have antibodies, I'm not gonna get sick, and you go around and aren't careful, then you could get sick because it could have been a false positive. We also don't know even if those antibodies are true positives and if they are protective, we don't know how long that protection may last. So again, the danger is that it could cause people to throw caution to the wind when they should still be very careful. Now, where should we be doing the antibody testing? There's one circumstance where I, I fully endorse it and we need to do it, and that is for looking for convalescent plasma. People who have recovered from COVID-19 may have antibodies at a very high level that could help someone else get over the disease who's critically ill. And there are protocols in place that allow us to take blood from a recovered person, separate the cells out from the liquid part, and in the liquid part, are those antibodies, which are proteins, and we can give them to certain other people who are suffering from COVID. If you don't measure for antibodies, you won't know whether you're giving the right kind of plasma to a sick person. So in those instances, yes, we need the antibody test, but it will come to pass. I'm predicting it will come to pass that we will get to the point where we understand what the overall prevalence of the disease is in, in San Antonio or in our community, and therefore we'll have a better way to tell you if you have a positive, what's the likelihood that that really means that you had the disease. That's going to happen, and then we are eventually going to know how long those antibodies last and whether they really protect you. From um, the SARS epidemic from back in 2003, 2004, it turned out that antibodies did develop and they were protective and those antibodies lasted about two to three years. So we could hope that that will be the case for COVID-19, but we don't know it today. Right, we don't know it yet. 
we're getting there, hopefully. Yeah. All right. Next question has to do with the jail. The county judge today said that 217 of 294 inmates at the jail tested positive and that they were asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. What does that tell us about the coronavirus? So it, it, there's a couple of things and I want to make a point, which is that an asymptomatic person may also be a pre-symptomatic person. In other words, I could do the test on you today. You don't feel anything and you're fine. Your test comes back positive. But if I monitor you closely, you could become symptomatic anytime ostensibly in the next 14 days, um, more likely sooner than that. But asymptomatics could also be pre-symptomatic, and we will have that data eventually from the jail because we're monitoring people for symptoms twice daily. Um, now, back to your question, what does this mean for coronavirus? What does it tell us? It tells us that really a large proportion of people, I'm going to be, I'm going to avoid giving you a percentage number, but a large proportion of people who get the virus are going to have such mild disease that they're not even going to notice it, or they're not going to think it's worth writing home about or going to get a test for. Yet, those are the folks who may be able to transmit it to others. That's the whole point of why we want people to mask, is because we know that we may have the virus and barely notice the symptoms, and yet the potential for transmission to others when we're barely symptomatic exists. How do we know this? We know this from uh, studies that have been done in China, and there's some very credible reports that do include some mathematical models that are coming out of Wuhan, China, and other places that really do show us how important these undocumented infections are. Undocumented means uh, we didn't go get a test because the symptoms were either mild or absent. So undocumented people clearly can transmit. Dr. Ruth Bergeron, UT Health San Antonio, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Happy to be here. We'll be right back. We got some breaking details in a shooting near Alamo Colleges. We told you a man was shot in the chest near Crockett Park in the Tobin Lofts. The San Antonio Fire Department is now confirming an Alamo Colleges police officer also hurt while responding to that shooting scene. We're told that the Alamo College's officer got into an accident while responding and is on his way to the hospital. The man who was shot also in the hospital right now, no word on any suspects. We're going to continue to track the latest on air and online at ksat.com. New tonight, a stolen food truck found after a high speed chase Saturday. It was social media that helped the owner get her property back. The night team's Jaffney Gray spoke with the owner, who says she is beyond grateful for everyone who helped. Great uh, representation of a citizen looking out for another citizen. It was this post on the San Antonio Food Truck Association's Facebook page that alerted customers, supporters, and the community about the top-notch diner food truck being stolen. The owner, Becky Price, says while moving, she unhitched the food truck trailer over the weekend, but soon learned that the trailer was no longer in San Antonio. There was a customer telling me, I see your trailer in Seguin. And then he texted me back and said, okay, the cops are chasing it. The Seguin Police Department got the call from another customer following the stolen trailer. Police Chief Terry Nichols said officers made a traffic stop, and though the driver, Jose Reyes Jr., complied with his arrest, the passenger, Ricardo Sanchez, jumped over to the driver's side and took off, leading police on a 30-minute pursuit. The driver fled, we got in a foot pursuit, and with the help of DPS and San Antonio PD, we captured the suspects. Price says she went right to the crime scene and retrieved what she she calls her livelihood. There's some train damage. There's AC venehood damage. The hitch and the jack is messed up. This is the inside of the trailer before it was stolen. Now, food and my freezer door is missing. My equipment's unattached and my bolted. I don't cry, but I don't think anyone could describe how hard I worked to build this. She says she can't be more thankful for the help of her customers, police, and her food truck family that helped get her trailer back. Though she has a long list of repairs to do, she says she will not stop her passion of serving others. I have to carry that on my back. We're going to roll. We're going to roll, and we're going to serve the community, and we are strong. You can't take the food truck people down. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Wish her all the best. Oh, absolutely. Live cam outside, 76 degrees. Very nice mm -hmm. Tuesday. Feels, feels great outside. Yeah, it's nice.
cooler today than what we had yesterday. Yesterday we were well into the 90s. Today we briefly hit 91 degrees, but most of the day was in the 80s. And some folks actually got a little bit of rain along the coastal plain and even a nice sunset. Check out this shot here on our KSAT Connect app. Actually, it's part of our Weather Authority app, but we can still call it KSAT Connect. This is out of Catula, Carl. Nice shot there of your beautiful sunset that you had south of San Antonio down I-35. Still a few lingering showers out there far south and southeast of San Antonio. Not as much as what we had earlier this evening right along the cold front. You can see that distinct line of showers and a few thunderstorms. That was the cold front, uh, which is still moving through South Texas. So as we go through the rest of the night, it it really wouldn't surprise me if we see a few more showers and thunderstorms developing even close to or around San Antonio. I think the coverage across South Texas will be about 30 to 40% of us. So the majority of us are not likely going to be seeing any rainfall. So if you do get the activity, Hey, consider yourself lucky. Even through 6 a.m. here, Futurecast is indicating a few little showers and maybe a few brief storms popping up, splash and dash coming and going. And I think we'll have that possibility all the way through about 9 or 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Temperature wise, 70 in Comfort, already 68 in Kerrville, Lost Maples at 67. But around Bear County, we're in the 70s from 71 in Holotus to 77 Port SA and Randolph right now at 75 degrees. And a few locations still in the 80s, including Catula right now at 82. There's the wind shift. That's from the cold front, that northeasterly breeze pulling in that less humid air again. So the humidity has been dropping and falling off. And our dew points now are about 10 to 20 degrees lower than this time yesterday. For most of us, those of you closer to the coastline, it's a different story. But even Pleasanton, Carrizo Springs, they've seen their dew points fall off into the 50s. So we have the pleasant comfortable air in place. And for the most part, the next seven days will feature a lack of humidity. All right, so tomorrow morning, 63 to start the day, a few stray showers out there. We're giving it 30 to 40% chance. And then some sunshine by the midday and afternoon. 85 for the high temperature, so near average for this time of year. Not overly humid either. Thursday is going to be similar. 60 in the morning, 80s in the afternoon, partly cloudy. Then by Friday, the next cold front hits with it. Just a slight chance of rain. And notice how temperatures take a dive behind that front on Saturday. We'll only be in the mid 70s for highs. That's with some sunshine. And then on Mother's Day, low 50s in the morning, near 80 with that sun. Thank you, Adam. That's a gift all of itself. Yes, right indeed. It's still ahead. A trip to the grocery store may be a little different as many deal with the changes at meatpacking plants. How it could impact prices and what we might see on store shelves. Next. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. As you shop for groceries, you're going to likely see limits on how many steaks, pork chops, chicken you can buy at one time. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz talks with an industry expert about what's going on and what you can expect at the meat counters. Costco is the latest store to limit how much fresh meat you can buy, something HEB and other grocers did too to help assure more shoppers have access. So what's going on? The bottom line is we have a we have a bottleneck in our packing plant system. Dr. David Anderson is an agriculture economist at Texas A&M. He says there is no shortage of livestock. We're set up this year to produce a record amount of beef, pork and chicken. But the coronavirus forced some processing plants to close or slow production. What we really have are tighter supplies. What can consumers expect on their pocketbook? Well, certainly we're, you know, on the wholesale side, we're certainly seeing higher prices. He says the wholesale price of a box of choice cuts is now double what it was three months ago. And at the retail level, Anderson says expect to see fewer choices for a while and climbing prices. I think I already notice higher prices at retail at grocery stores. While Anderson expects the pandemic's effect on the meat supply chain to linger, he says there is no reason for panic hoarding. Oh, I hope not. Um, you know, let's not make this like toilet paper. But there's going to be plenty for everybody. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. There are several creative ways graduates are documenting their ceremonies. We take a look at some of them coming up.
Evo Entertainment is offering to host drive-in graduation ceremonies for free. There is a location in shirts and they're able to project live or recorded footage onto screens and broadcast sound directly to FM radios for all vehicles who attend drive-in ceremonies. We have a link to the form needed to complete this type of request online at ksat.com. We also have an entire section with the latest updates on the coronavirus. Well, speaking of which, there are many creative ways 2020 graduates are holding ceremonies. Trent Johnson Jr. is racking up views on Twitter for a video of him accepting an <laughs> MD from Ohio State University while in his Florida living room. He's decked out in a cap and gown while family and friends cheer him cheer him on in the background. One young man is saying thanks in a special way. 22-year-old Eddie Lynn has been making thank you balloon art for essential workers in his community of Edison, New Jersey. Lynn, who was diagnosed with autism at age three, is even taking requests from family members of frontline workers. He's crafted everything from a post office truck to even baby Yoda. That is incredible. That's talented. Wow, he's absolutely, yeah. that is just amazing. Baby Yoda. <laughs> That's the craze nowadays. Yeah. Right? <laughs> All right, so we'll be in the 80s the next few days. And by the way, a few little showers here and there tonight through about 9, 10 a.m. tomorrow. Only about 30 to 40 percent of us will see it. Next cold front hits Friday. Have a great night. GMSA at 430. Good night.